Norwich lived most of her adult life in reclusivity, yet still her words and prayers touched the lives of so many. Julian was never one to shy away from the grim aspects of life and death, often finding comfort in the image and the meaning of the crucifixion. So today, as we continue our Lenten journey towards that very cross, let us reflect on her words spoken during a vision that exposed her to her own frailty and vulnerability. A vision that revealed to her this, her faith can be a lifeline to the substance of God's love. And that that steadying, loving presence will always see us through the darkest of days. Let us pray. A vision of Jesus came to Julian with this word, you will not be overcome. She heard it distinctly and firmly, sharing the confidence and comfort with all who feel that trouble may come. And Jesus did not say you will never have a rough passage, you will never be outstrained, or you will never be overwhelmed, but he did say you will never be overcome. And so today, we pray in the spirit of Julian's vision. God, help us to pay attention to these words, to trust you with strong confidence through thick and thin. God, you love us and delight in us. God, in return, you ask that we have love and delight in your presence, trusting you with all our strength assured that all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Amen. Today we got two stories, a woman at a well and an official with a sick son. And we're going to talk about how I think those stories are actually connected in John's imagination. When you read the interaction in John 4, it feels kind of strange. Uh, the woman says, look, man, it's kind of weird that you're out here asking me for water in the middle of the day. And Jesus responds, actually, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for living water. To which she replies, what are you talking about? He says, whoever drinks the water I offer will never thirst again. You see, this water that I give becomes in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so the woman replies, okay, I see where this is going. Tell me more. Now we get to the famous part of the story, right? Jesus says, go and get your husband. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, that's right. You've had five husbands and the man you are with now is not your husband. Now, the simple fact is that a woman in the first century could not divorce a husband. She could only be divorced by a husband. In other words, uh, this is a woman who has been continually abandoned and discarded by the man in her life, and she has continued to pick herself back up and move forward regardless. And the way that she responds to Jesus' comments indicates that she understood his intent and compassion. She saw his words as welcome, not criticism. And so she says, I can see that you're a prophet, and they begin to talk about their various religious traditions. And so here, on his way back to Cana, the rural region that he comes from in the north, returning from a big religious festival in the south, he interacts with a Samaritan woman in the middle. A human person who was a very different experience of gender and the associated cultural norms. 
a human person who comes from a related but different ethnic and religious background from himself. He empathizes with the imbalances. He commends her for her religious practice and devotion. And he says, a day is coming when where we worship and how we worship won't matter. A day when all of our limitations and misconceptions will be swallowed up by grace. And on that day, we will all of us worship in spirit and truth. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. Again, we're laying groundwork here. We're connecting back to where we were last week. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. And the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. Is there anything wrong with what this man is asking for? Of course not. He has a son in pain, a child that he loves. Of course he would advocate for healing. But remember, this story, this chapter, is more than just about a son in need. This is about the world to come. And so we get this really interesting contradiction here. Where Jesus says, you won't believe without a sign. So no, no sign for you. You'll have to leave trusting. And he does. And then John tells us that all of this is a sign of things to come. Except here's the real beauty of all that. That is a gift to everyone in this chapter. Because Samaritan women who notice the Messiah talking with them as equals, they return home as leaders in their communities ready to expand the story for everyone. And royal officials that gain the ability to trust in the goodness of God beyond just what they can demand with their stature, they become the kind of people that slowly decouple their imagination of God from the expectations of their culture. And when that truly begins to happen, then even those royal officials can become signs of God's blessing to those who've been struggling to see the divine all along. And maybe this is the sign of things to come, a world in which the hungry are filled with good things and the rich are sent away empty. And both of them are better for it. The promise of a God that loves each of us enough to meet us wherever we are with the healing that we need specifically. May the sign of things to come give us hope for the healing of our bodies today, absolutely. But perhaps also the healing of our expectations and assumptions about God. And the trust that as we grow in awareness of the goodness that surrounds us always, learning to celebrate what comes near to us instead of just a demanding of more. That we might actually see the unending graciousness of God and the ways that we can become a blessing beyond ourselves to those who need it.